Hi everyone. I'm glad that you made it to stay until the last session of this conference. Today I'll talk about memory consumption of a Java process. Uh, not about a Java application, but about a Java process as a whole from the operating system perspective. A few words about myself. Uh, so I'm the lead developer of large social network, which is mostly entirely written in Java. I also used to work uh, at Sun Microsystems and Oracle on Java virtual machines, including the most well-known one, the Hotspot virtual machine. That's why I'm passionate about all GVM internals. Also, if you've heard about Async Profiler, I'm actually this guy who wrote it. Today I'll show you a few tricks you can do with Async Profiler as well. So a few years ago, the architecture of our project implied uh, one Java application per server. It was pretty easy to manage, but obviously not very efficient from resource utilization point of view. So we started building our own cloud where one server can be shared by several Java applications. Uh, but then comes the problem of isolation. One application obviously shouldn't be able to consume all CPU or all memory and let the other application start in. Containers can solve this problem. If you are familiar with Docker Compose, Kubernetes or whatever, you probably know that configuring quotas for a container is very simple. You just put a few numbers in manifest file and that's it. But when it comes to Java, Java already has a way to limit memory of a Java application, right? If we start Java with minus XMX for gigabytes, we expect that it will, the application will not take more than four gigabytes of RAM. Yes? Of course, the GVM itself also requires some memory for its own purposes, but presumably not too much. So, if I run four gigabytes Java process in a 10 gigs container, I'll expect that everything will work perfectly. But if everything were so simple, I obviously would be making this presentation. And it's not an uncommon case, then a operating system suddenly comes and kills your Java process because it reaches the memory quarter. But wait, Java already has the container support for a while. Uh, so let's just use the most recent GDK and the problem is solved. Unfortunately not. There is no magic in so-called container support. Actually the option affects nothing but the number of CPUs visible to the Java process and the amount of memory used to calculate the default heap size. But the JVM doesn't even attempt to satisfy these limits. Uh, so. The same problem may happen again. The out-of-memory killer of the operating system will forcibly terminate the Java process. Apparently, I'm not the only one who faced this problem. There are dozens of questions on Stack Overflow asking why Java is so hungry and how to restrain its appetite. People keep asking such questions again and again, and that's actually motivated me to prepare this talk. Okay, first let's see how to find the actual footprint of the Java process. Probably the easiest way to do it in Linux is with top command. We uh, just list the processes sorted by the amount of used memory. And on this picture, Java is the top consumer. But what numbers to look at here? The virtual memory may look scary, but it's not the actual footprint. It's just the amount of reserved address space for the process. Res or resident set size is the number we're interested in. This is actually the amount of physical RAM used by the process. Nine gigabytes in this case. Where do these nine gigabytes come from? In Linux, there is a useful utility pmap that shows you a complete memory map of a Java process. 
In this talk, I'll focus on Linux, though in other operating systems, the behavior of Java is pretty much the same. So the memory map is this long, long table describing every single address range owned by the process. So for every address space range, we see the amount of memory, um, the length of this range, and the amount of uh, the memory in residence set. That is exactly the footprint. Uh, some regions are mapped to the files on a disk, like jar files or shared libraries. The other are anonymous, that is not backed by any file, just memory. Uh, the highlighted one is a single address range of 4 gigabytes in size. What could it be? Apparently Java heap. It's easy to guess. But what about other? In order to find the sources of well, other sources of memory consumption, let's remember how JVM works. Obviously, its job is not only to collect garbage. JVM does a lot more things. It loads classes, it compiles bytecode, it manages threads, and so on. And all these activities require additional memory. Fortunately, the JVM itself can tell how much memory it uses for its own purposes. Uh, there is a feature, native memory tracking, available since GDK 7. Uh, you just need to turn on this GVM flag, and that's it. But why it is not enabled by default then? Obviously because it's not free. Uh, even according to the documentation, the runtime overhead of this feature can be as large as 5 to 10%. Uh, furthermore, for every allocated block of native memory, NMT uses two additional machine words. It's important to notice, though, that native memory tracking watches only memory allocated by the JVM. And if you load, for example, a third-party GNA li library, the memory allocated by this library won't be tracked by native memory tracking. When the feature is turned on, you can ask the GVM to print the native memory tracking report at any time with this J command. By the way, do many of you know about J command utility? Who knows? Well, many of you. Good, because it's really useful utility and highly recommended. Um, as a result of this command, you'll get such a long sheet of numbers. This is a native memory check report. It contains several sections describing the, each part, each subsystem of the GVM in detail. Well, uh, the first two numbers are reserved and committed. The total committed size, um, that is actually the size the GVM claims to use at the moment. The memory can be allocated in two different ways, either with a system allocator, malloc, or GM can also ask memory directly from the operating system with a map system call. Let's go through the report in detail. So the most obvious part is Java heap. It's obviously where the Java objects stay. However, in addition to Java heap, there is another section called GC. Why is it here? Let's consider G1, for example. So the Java heap is broken down into regions. Some belong to old generation, some to Eden, survivor space, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, the total sum of all regions uh, is limited by XMX value. But in order to manage the Java heap, the GC algorithm itself requires additional memory. And this memory is not included in XMX limit. Uh, for example, in order to traverse the object graph to find the reachable objects, GC uses another structure of heap structure, mark bitmap, where it marks the visited objects. The traversal algorithm itself requires uh, some more memory, the marks text. Finally, an important uh, GC structure, probably the biggest one, is remembered sets. 
it contains the cross-region references. And you can't set the size of remembered set directly, but uh, indirectly, um, the size of the regions, G1 regions, affects the size of remembered sets. Different GC algorithms may use different structures, but in any case, all of them require additional memory. I have made an experiment measuring uh, the overhead of different GC algorithms. Uh, last time I showed this slide, I got many comments like, wait, my numbers are quite different. Well, of course they are, because uh, the numbers will differ depending on the version of GDK, uh, the JVM options, and in particular, the depending on the application and its allocation pattern. So don't treat it as a single point of truth. Anyway, the idea is not to compare the GC algorithms, but to show that um, the of heap overhead of GC is not always negligible. So for example, if you ha have a 20 gigabytes heap, be prepared to waste a couple of more gigabytes just to let the GC do its job. Okay, speaking about heap size, uh, you know that there, are, there is XMX option that sets the maximum heap size and XMS that sets the initial heap size. And if we set them equal, we expect that uh, the process will allocate this exactly amount of heap space. But if you run the simplest program and look at top command for the resident set size, we'll see that uh, RSS will be pretty small, uh, not four gigabytes. So how could it be? Uh, the reason is that operating system allocates uh, pages of me memory in the physical memory lazily on the first touch of these pages. Uh, so initially when the heap is not used and it doesn't consume the physical memory. Uh, but such lazy access may cause undesired page faults in runtime, and this can be bad for low latency applications. And here's the JVM option that uh, literally makes the JVM go through the all heap and touch every single pages of heap. And if we now run the JVM with always pre-touch option, and we will see that uh, now our process indeed takes four gigabytes in RAM. Uh, I found that XMS option is often misunderstood. Um, so many developers thinking that uh, it's the minimum size. But actually, mm, even if you set the XMS equal to XMX, the heap can still resize and it can even uh, the size can even decrease below the XMS value. And if you really don't want the heap to resize, uh, turn off adaptive size policy instead. Adaptive size policy is turned on by default and it allows the heap to grow and shrink. There are a couple of options that uh, configure how aggressively the heap grows and shrinks. But anyway, the adaptive size policy can be a useful thing because it allows the GVM to return memory back to the operating system. It can be useful, for example, uh, for desktop applications. Uh, for example, when you run IDE and uh, when you compile a large project, it's okay that the GVM takes all the available memory. But when IDE is idle, you'd probably want for that GVM will release the memory for other applications on your desktop or laptop. Releasing and or releasing memory sounds like a cool feature. So I set up another experiment measuring how different GC algorithms are good at uncommitting memory. My test used two gigabytes maximum heap and 32 max initial. Uh, first, the test loaded a large set of data, worked with it, and then dropped away and performed GC. 
at first parallel GC wasn't doing any uncommit at all. It never returned memory back to the operating system. CMS was able to uncommit memory, but only in few steps after calling system.gc. J1 was very aggressive in committing heap, but it could instantly release e all of it after full GC. And the new feature since GDK 12 allows G1 to uncommit memory not only after full GC, but after regular concurrent cycle as well. But before GDK 12, the only garbage collector that was able to uncommit heap memory at concurrent GC cycle was Shenandoah. I mean, with no full GC at all. Okay, that's all about heap and GC. What else can take memory in the JVM? The class loading is the next subsystem that adds to the footprint, and there is also a section in NMT report. And this report go became even bigger since GDK 10. It, now it includes two parts, metaspace and class space. And what are they? Uh, by the way, you've heard about metaspace and metadata, yeah? Yeah, most of you. Uh, so basically metadata is the result of parsing class files. Oh, before GDK 8, this metadata was stored in perm gen, and perm gen was limited in size, and you could probably see out of memory error, perm gen space error. But now, since GDK 8, uh, this data goes to Metaspace, and Metaspace is unlimited by default. Uh, uh, every Java object has a pointer to its class in Metaspace. Uh, when the heap is relatively small, less than 32 gigabytes, uh, JVM turns on compressed tubes optimization by default. Uh, this optimization makes uh, object reference 32 bits instead of 64 bits. And uh, with this optimization, also another similar one, use compressed class pointers is turned on by default. Uh, it allows this uh, pointer to class of every object to be also 32 bits in size. And when this option is on, the class metadata is moved from metaspace to a separate region called compressed class space. And this compressed class space size uh, is limited in size. It is one gigabyte by default. The maximum possible size is three gigs. And here comes the problem again. So if for some reason your application loads too many classes, uh, you can see out of memory error, compressed class space. Uh, okay, if you see such a problem, how to analyze the metaspace usage? Uh, you can print class loader statistics with another useful J command. So, in this example, we see that uh, class loader call, called bytecode generator generated 100,000 classes of more than 80 megabytes in, to, in size. It's even possible to get detailed statistics for each individual class, how much memory um, used for its methods, fields, annotations, and so on. But how to limit the metaspace footprint? Uh, first of all, there are two options that limit metaspace size and compressed class space size. By the way, max metaspace size also includes compressed class space size. Mm. Another GVM option which is often misinterpreted. Metaspace size uh, sets neither the initial nor the minimal size. It's uh, instead the high watermark. So when the metaspace usage reaches this watermark, the uh, garbage collection cycle is triggered. So if you ever seen in GC logs such a message, metadata GC threshold, and be aware that it's because of this watermark. Metaspace can also grow and shrink, and these two options configure how aggressively it does so. But that's all about metaspace. What else contributes to GVM footprint? 
JIT compiler. Again, there are two sections uh, devoted to JIT compilation, the code and compiler. The code cache is where the compiled code resides, but not only the compiled methods. So uh, even if you turn on JIT compilation completely, the interpreter and some runtime stops will also go to code cache. These two options uh, control the initial and the maximum size of the code cache. But again, like with uh, garbage collection, there is another section. Uh, the um, not JIT compiler algorithms also require additional memory for its own purposes to build their IR graph, and basically to run compilation algorithms, another uh, portion of memory is required. And uh, this memory is so roughly proportional to the number of compiler threads. And here's a question for you. And what about Graal JIT? You've uh, heard about Graal, right? And does it also require score cache or compiler arenas? What do you think? Um, actually, Graal is written in Java, and uh, it runs like a regular Java program. So it builds its own structures in Java heap instead of, of heap memory. So with Graal JIT, there is no compiler arenas. But uh, the code compiled with Graal still goes to code cache. Well, how large is the code cache? Uh, Hotspot has two JIT compilers, C1 and C2, or C1 and Graal. Um, to, and to accommodate more compiled code, their default code cache size is increased by the factor of five. And the opposite is also true. So if for some reason disable tiered compilation, then their code cache will uh, decrease dramatically. So it will become just uh, 48 megabytes in size, which probably wouldn't be enough for a large enough application. Sometimes even 240 max is not enough. And we saw a so uh, one day we saw a big performance degradation with one of our services that was called, caused by a core cache issue. And when the core cache grew up to its limit, um, Hotspot started to throw away earlier compiled code. But since this code was hot, it, um, it started to compile this code again, and guess what happened then? So it compiles the code, throw it away, then compile it again, and uh, basically spent too much time doing, uh, wasting time for CPU resources for compilation. So after this incident, we started monitoring code cache as well as our other memory pools. Fortunately, it's, uh, these statistics is available for free. Uh, there are standard MX bins, which can be monitored through JMX. For example, if you connect with Java Mission Control, uh, just switch, switch to the memory tab and you'll see the amount of memory used by code cache and metaspace and so on. But not all pools are easy to monitor this way. Uh, thread stacks, uh, they also consume native memory. And there is also a native memory checker section in, in devoted to threads. And the numbers there may look scary. For example, 500 threads will use more than half a gigabyte. That's because the default thread stack size is one megabyte. It can be tuned with XSS option, but the things are not as bad as they may seem. Uh, remember that operating system allocates memory pages in physical memory lazily, and the top of the stack 
usually remain untouched. So it actually doesn't uh, use physical memory uh, unless uh, you have a really deep recursion. And to avoid this confusion, in JDK 11, native memory tracker report was fixed to count not uh, the committed memory of thread stacks, but uh, actually the resident part of the stack size. So now it will tell that an average Java application consumes about somewhere between 50 and 200 kilobytes per thread. Not so bad. Uh, Symbols is another interesting section in NMT report. It counts memory consumed by two JVM internal hash tables, the symbol table and string table. Uh, symbol table contains various names and signatures, while the string table contains reference to internal strings. If for some reason your application uh, creates too many internal strings, uh, this can bloat the table. Um, a recent GDK has another useful G command to print the statistics of these tables. Uh, in this example, 10 million internal strings took uh, more than 700 megabytes. If you happen to see an issue with string table or symbol table, so you can dump the whole contents of this table. Uh, if you're interested how to do this, uh, there is my, my answer on Stack Overflow. Okay, I'll skip some other sections in MT report as they're not of a big importance to us, but this one is really interesting because it can grow enormously large. And who knows what's in the internal section? Uh, this is an off heap, or in other words, direct memory of the application, whatever you allocate with or unsafe or through direct byte buffers goes to this internal section. But the name sounds confusing, right? Uh, direct byte buffers have nothing to do with internal JVM memory. And this was fixed in GDK 11. So there by buffer, the section in MT report devoted to byte buffers was renamed from internal to other, but as to me, this doesn't sound much clearer. So let's talk about direct byte buffers and its relation to footprint. So there are two kinds of direct byte buffers. Uh, one that you allocate with byte buffer allocate direct call, and this memory can be limited with uh, another GVM option. But the default direct memory size is, looks strange to me because it's equal to the heap size, but there is no direct relation between heap and of heap memory. But anyway, so if your application have uh, uses much direct memory, it's uh, um, it can be a good idea to limit the direct memory. The mapped byte buffers are even worse because they can be limited at all. Uh, furthermore, they are not counted in native memory tracking reports. But do they really contribute to the footprint? Uh, they definitely can. Uh, to remember about memory map of the process, so you can run pmap to see uh, the actual residence at size consumed by memory mapped files or mapped by buffers. So for uh, databases, this amount of memory can be really large. Uh, you can also monitor byte buffers through JMX, JConsole, Mission Control, and other tools will do. Just look for byte buffer and bin. Uh, there are two embeds, one for direct buffers, the other one for mapped byte buffers. It's not too it's not too easy to manage memory consumed by direct byte buffers because there is no standard way to 
release byte buffers. They are released uh, automatically if uh, JVM sees no references to the byte buffer. Uh, so, if you have a large Java heap, for example, and GC doesn't happen too often, so you can run out of uh, direct memory earlier than GC happens. And there is a funny way of handling this in Hotspot JVM, um, in GDK, actually. So, uh, if allocation of direct buffer fails, the GDK runs a GC cycle, literally by calling system.gc, and waits for some time, hoping that uh, GC will be able to free memory uh, to reclaim uh, some room for unused byte buffers, and then uh, tries again. And this leads to interesting consequences. Uh, if you, for some reason, disable the explicit GC, this algorithm will not work. And this will basically fail with out-of-memory error. That's why in our systems we never use disable explicit GC option, but instead uh, set explicit GC invokes concurrent. So explicit GC is not always uh, bad. Okay, if uh, direct by buffers are that bad, maybe it's better to use heap byte buffers instead. Mm. Well, the heap byte buffers is not a solution. Because uh, in Java, uh, Java cannot do I.O. with heap byte buffers. So whenever you try to read or write from a heap byte buffer, uh, the JDK allocates a temporary direct buffer, copies the data to it, and after that releases the byte buffer. But this allocation and releasing uh, may cause overhead, of course. That's why there is an internal cache in GDK for temporary direct by buffers. Uh, you may notice it in heap dump, for example, this uh, Sun NIO buffer cache. And the best thing about this buffer cache is it never shrinks. The larger byte buffers may replace a smaller in this cache, but uh, they are not thrown away from this cache at all. Uh, furthermore, this buffer cache is thread local. So if you have many Java threads working with uh, heap byte buffers, then you are in trouble. But the good news is that the uh, maximum size of byte buffer that goes to this cache can be limited. <coughs> so if you um, run an application that intensively uses direct by buffers, for example, uh, elastic source or, or something, that they can be a good idea to limit their max cached buffer size. But that is not the only problem with direct by buffers. Uh, look at this code. Nothing bad from a first glance. We allocate direct by buffers, but they are not referenced anywhere, so they can be immediately freed, right? Uh, okay, I ran this test with a small heap and with a relatively small direct memory limit and watched their actual memory consumption. So uh, here one gigabyte heap and two gigabytes max direct memory size. So watched resident set size of the process, which was growing and growing and growing, uh, which became much bigger than direct memory plus the heap size. Okay, but now we already know about native memory tracking, so let's examine the process with NMT. But NMT says that uh, the total committed memory is less than three gigabytes. So somebody must be lying. <laughs> okay, virtual memory map to the rescue again. Uh, if you look through the memory map, you'll find that indeed the resident set size uh, is seven gigabytes and more. 
And what is strange in this memory map, there are a lot of these anonymous regions, roughly of uh, 64 megabytes in size. And this magic number, 64 megabytes, suggests that the problem has something to do with the standard allocator. Uh, malloc is the standard C library called to allocate memory and direct byte buffers use malloc under the hood. So malloc reserves the memory from the operating system in large chunks, exactly 64 megabytes in size. But uh, this is just the reservation. So um, the malloc commits memory with the smaller portions with another system call and protect, and then their memory blocks are located within this and uh, protected area. Uh, some blocks can be uh, freed, reused, but uh, the native memory blocks are never moved. So uh, in our example, when we allocated the direct memory blocks of different uh, random sizes, this could obviously lead to fragmentation. And uh, so we can end up in a situation when there is uh, much uh, free memory in this uh, malloc arenas, but uh, there is not enough uh, contiguous chunks to allocate more. So this is basically the fragmentation problem of the standard system allocator, and Java can do nothing about it. Fortunately, there is a number of alternative allocators. The most known ones are gmalloc from FreeBSD and tcmalloc from Google PerfTools. Recently, Microsoft announced uh, their own replacement for malloc, and they claim that it outperforms both gmalloc and tcmalloc, uh, but I can't say anything so far about mimalloc. We haven't tried it in production, but what we did use in production is gmalloc, and it performs really well. So replacing standard system allocator is uh, pretty simple. You just need to set one system, one environment variable, and that's it. And this one line change magically helped us to reduce the resident set size of the previous example. Uh, so it appears that gmalloc is much better in handling fragmentation. Another benefit of gmalloc is that it has a built-in allocation profiler. And in order to use it, we need to compile gmalloc with a special option. Uh, with enable prof, and then we can set another environment variable to turn on malloc profiling. So uh, here I set the gprof out the name of the output file and uh, profiling interval. 30 means that uh, um, the allocated memory, every 2 power 30 allocated bytes will be sampled. And finally, there is a comment to visualize the collected profile, but uh, it's better to see this in action. So uh, here is my uh, pretty simple Java example. It's uh, uh, just a servlet which uh, handles HTTP requests and uh, looks for an image with a given name, uh, loads it uh, from the resources and returns it as, as a byte array. Nothing fancy. Okay, right, I run get image example and look for resident set size. It grows, grows, increases. increases, and it will keep increasing until the application crashes. And there is probably a memory leak, but uh, it looks there is no 
it's not obvious where the memory leak in this simple Java application, right? Okay, let's use gmalloc profiler. So I set the LD preload variable, set malloc conf to, uh, to turn on allocation profiling, and then run the test again. Let it work for some time to collect the profile. Uh, hopefully uh, 10 seconds will be enough. Okay, now run gprof to produce oh okay didn't collect it. Let's try once again. Let it work for some a bit longer. Yeah, now it collected the profile and created the SVG graph. And here it is. This is a nice graph of allocations, native allocations, not Java allocations. So we see that uh, a lot of memory is allocated by the GVM itself, like in, in G1 garbage collector, but it's not in class loader, but that's not what we are interested in. Probably the biggest part is inflate backend, which comes from Java Util Zip Inflator. But uh, we didn't use uh, Java Util Zip or Inflator in our simple code, right? Mm. And unfortunately, Gmail doesn't tell where this inflate bytes called from. So uh, the graph ends, ends with some address. Uh, that's because the Gmail cannot walk the Java stack traces. It knows about uh, native libraries, so it can show the symbol names, the names of native functions, but not about Java code. Okay, do you know the profiler which can work both with uh, native stack traces and Java stack traces? It's async profiler. Okay, unset all deep reload and run application again. Now profile the with async profiler. So here I run the profiler for five seconds and I profile malloc, system malloc calls and uh, dump the output to malloc SVG graph. And here how it looks. Uh, do you familiar with flame graphs? Who knows flame graphs? Oh, many of you, good. So this is, uh, basically shows the stack traces where the malloc is called. So we see uh, many mallocs are called from the GVM itself. This is shown in yellow, or G1, compiler, and so on. But uh, uh, green is Java code. So malloc is often called from Unix file system, get boolean attributes. It's something strange. The problem with profiling malloc is that it doesn't always show the real native memory leak because the memory allocated by malloc can be almost immediately freed and we don't know, the profiler doesn't make difference. But if we remember how malloc works, so, uh, it increases the committed memory with another system call, mprotect. So, uh, let us profile and protect instead. We can also do it with a sync profiler, just the same comment, but now use uh, and protect event instead of malloc. Also, five seconds should be enough. 
let's see. Yeah, here's another flame, flame graph. Now we see that M protect is called from inflator. Okay, this is uh, uh, G Malik also told us about inflator. So we could believe this, but now this gives us a JavaStack traces. So we can see where this uh, inflator is created in our code. And it is indeed comes from our code with get resources stream system call. So basically these lines which cause the leak. Uh, get resources stream creates all these uh, inflators under the hood. And the problem is that we create, uh, get an input stream, but we never close it in our case. And it's a quite common problem, uh, quite common source of native memory leaks, uh, unclosed zip files or in resource input streams. Okay, let me show another simple test. Um, it is also very simple, does nothing interesting but reading the file uh, and uh, does some login if something goes wrong. Okay, run file test, look at the memory usage. At first, residence at size of the process start growing, but then it stops growing at 1.3 gigabytes. But the free memory in the system decreases and decreases, but that's not our Java command. So the resident set size doesn't increase. But the problem is definitely has something to do with our Java program, because when we stop it, then the memory is freed and it's no longer decreases. So where's the problem here? You see that uh, what increases is the cache of the operating system, the page cache. Uh, and the page cache doesn't even belong to the process. It's a shared concept uh, in the operating system. But somehow our simple application uh, consumes more and more page cache. And how to find where the problem is. So, uh, again, a simple file to the rescue, it can, mm, besides system calls, it can profile uh, certain operating system trace points. Uh, you can see a list of available trace points with perf list. So let's look for something related to page cache. Yeah. There is a special trace point in the operating system, uh, which is called exactly when a new page is added to the page cache. So let's profile this trace point with the scene profiler. Uh, exactly the same comment as before, but now the profile event is the name of this trace point. And again, it uh, shows us a flame graph showing where, uh, where the pages mm, are added to the page cache. And this is the whole stack uh, from the Linux kernel down to system code and down to Java code. So actually, which is Java code to blame is uh, the logger Uh, what uh, causes the problem in our case is this line. And this happened because uh, I forgot to configure the logger properly. Uh, I didn't configure log rotation. So the error happens again and again. I write to the log file. This log file never closes. And until the file is closes, uh, all, everything I write is, is written through to the page cache. 
So the fix is prob is uh, very simple, just to enable log rotation in this case. Okay. Uh, so, getting back to the initial question, why Java is so hungry and how to limit its footprint? And I'm afraid you won't like the answer, because it's really hard, if not impossible, to estimate the memory footprint of a Java application, because there are too many factors to consider. And some of the region, regions that, uh, uh, some of the structures that add to the memory footprint are not even under our control. There is no single GVM option, and there is no even a set of GVM options that you can set and make the GVM uh, not use more than the specified limit. But the good news is that uh, it is possible to monitor and profile the real memory usage with the uh, tools and techniques discussed today, including GMX, GMALOC, uh, memory maps from the operating system, native memory tracker, and async profiler. And that's everything I wanted to tell you today, and feel free to ask questions uh, after this session. So I'll be here for a while. Thank you.